sometimes people that get really mad about the word NFT, you know, it's starting to get polarizing. For those people, I often say, well, hold on, slow down. You have to acknowledge that we're having this transition into digital ownership long before NFTs ever came. Hi, and welcome to The Financial Fox, finance, investment, and crypto with a twist. I'm your host, Steffi B. I'm the founder of PR company Cassiopeia Services, and every week I bring to you my favorite conversations with investment experts, market disruptors, mover and shakers, and the coolest projects in crypto. So how many of you own an NFT? I guess quite a few, and if you're not, maybe you are considering it, and uh, perhaps you are learning about it. So NFT are considered an alternative investment, especially for the younger generation. But there are some important questions that we should ask ourselves before we make any kind of investment in the NFT space. It's not just understanding what is an NFT, which is actually a very important point, but also how do you safely store your NFT? So to answer this question, which uh, I also was quite unsure, I decided to interview an expert, NFT pioneer, Jason Bailey, founder of Artnome, but also founder of Club NFT, which is his latest venture. He has raised around $3 million to create backup solution to protect collectors and the billion dollars in the NFT space. So, before we go into the interviews, if you are not subscribed to our YouTube channel, make sure they hit the subscribe button and follow us on social media to stay up to date with our news and interviews. If you have any comment or any feedback, leave them in the comment section in the YouTube channel. That will be great. And also remember that we are not giving any financial advice here. So all the content is for informational purposes. And if you are interested or want to do any kind of investment in the crypto space, you need to do your own research and then, you know, decide, take the risk that you are incurring. It is an early space. So, you know, you need to bear with the volatility and also all the uncertainties they are related to that. Finally, before we go into the episode, I want to talk about my new crypto web domain, financialfox.crypto, which I got it from Unstoppable Domains that is creating a new generation of web domain, which are actually domain day that you buy once and you don't have to worry about renewable fees anymore because they are decentralized and no one can take them down or hack your data because they are only yours. Also, because they are effectively domain NFTs, you can trade them and make money once the decentralized web will be taking over the internet. The cool thing is about crypto payment because you can actually add your wallet address to your web domain address and forget about it. So when you just need to get paid, you just give your crypto web domain and voila, the, ca- the money comes straight away into your wallet. So if you are interested in getting an unstoppable domain just go using the link in the description, which uh, is going to help to support our channel. And if you want to help us a little bit more because you like the work that you are, we are doing and you like the content, then you can make a donation in Ethereum, Bitcoin, or USDC to financialfox.crypto. And that will be super appreciated. But let's not waste any more time. And let's go straight into the interview. I'm sure you're going to enjoy. Hey, Jason, how are you? Doing great, Stefania. How are you today? I'm fine. I'm fine. So it's really good to have you on the show. I mean, you are a veteran of the NFT space. Yeah, I'm the gray beard, the old man of of (laughs) NFTs. Listen, how long have you been in the space for? So uh, I got started in 2017. There were actually people that that got in even earlier than I did, but generally I'm credited with writing one of the first articles about how the NFTs, and we didn't even call them NFTs back then, but how blockchain art was going to to be a big new market in the traditional art market. So there was an article called The Blockchain Art Market is Here. 
that I wrote in 2017. And, and then wow. I became part of that community uh, pretty early on. So yeah, I've, I've been at it for a while now. Right. So let's uh, go straight into that because um, uh, quite a few times in my channel, I talk about alternative investment and obviously NFT perform this kind of function, especially for the younger generation. Do you maybe want to elaborate on that, on why NFT are becoming so popular as a way, um, you know, not only to show off, but actually to invest? Yeah, I think um, they become popular as a way to invest and maybe as a way to collect um, art for, for non-investment reasons. Um, and maybe we can touch on both of those. So I think um, for, for more altruistic reasons, the, the reason people are excited about collecting now, I think in the traditional art world, uh, many people were intimidated. They felt like if you go to the gallery, if you don't have enough money or if people are judging you or like, you know, it might be a little bit intimidating. Maybe you don't have the background or the knowledge or if you don't know enough about art, you don't want to say something stupid. Um, but there are a lot of people in the world that love art and would love an opportunity to collect and participate in collecting art. Uh, and, and I think with this new online um, opportunity through NFTs, a lot of that friction is removed. You don't have to worry about being rejected or told that you're, you know, that you're collecting the wrong thing. You really just have to, once you're set up, you just have to hit a button, right? So we've kind of removed the friction. Yeah. And then on the other side of that, you know, once you collect something, uh, most of us, a lot of our friendships and communication and socialization is happening online now. So you can, you know, click the button to buy and then you can click a button to share and let everybody know, like, check out this great artist that I've, you know, just supported and participated with. And I really like them for reasons X, Y, and Z. And we see communities start to form around that, particularly during the pandemic. In terms of investment, I think what we're seeing there are, are a few things. So, we're moving increasingly towards digital ownership um, where people, you know, sometimes people that get really mad about the word NFT, you know, it's starting to get polarizing where there are some people that are very mad about NFTs and they're like, you know, I, I don't like NFTs. But for those people, I often say, well, hold on, slow down. You have to acknowledge that we at least acknowledge that we're having this transition into digital ownership long before NFTs ever came. So, you know, I had tape cassettes. I'm old enough that I had, you know, tape cassettes and then I had, you know, CDs and now my music, it doesn't exist physically at all, right? I, you know, I access my music digitally. Similarly, I had VHSs and then DVDs and now we have Netflix, right? So there's been this dematerialization um, of ownership that's been happening for decades, arguably now. And I think Art was just a little bit behind. And now that we have NFTs, uh, a lot of us three or four years ago started thinking, well, maybe this could be this format of NFTs could be the thing that's missing that allows digital artists to be able to participate and create a market because there really weren't that many people investing before. So the younger generation who it's sort of intuitive, they grew up with video games and digital ownership. It makes a lot of sense for them and they're rushing in because they see this opportunity to participate in collecting in a way that makes sense and resonates for them. I think it's still difficult for a lot of older folks to try to figure out like, why would I buy a JPEG that I can see for free? Or why would I buy this? And, and, they yeah, and everybody brings nonsense. up a, all this issue about do I own it? Do I don't own it? You know, IP and all stuff like all this legal stuff that makes things so complicated that at the end of the day, because also it's an asset that is not regulated. You can't get your head around it and you say, OK, right. This is just, uh, you know, it's not safe. Better that I stay out. Yeah, I think it depends on where you are. Um, I don't want to say as an investor, because I'll never tell people to go invest in NFTs. I tell them to collect <laughs> NFTs, and we can talk about that in a bit. But I think if we look at this um, in, in terms of if, if you were uh, older and have accumulated a lot of wealth and have a lot of things, a lot of you know, uh, a risk there that you could potentially lose that position of power, right? Then you might be very careful and thoughtful about things. But if you feel like you're part of a generation that could never afford to buy a house or could never participate in, like you know, then all of a sudden these things that seem like crazy, risky investments start to sound more appealing because it's like they, you know, younger people can't necessarily see a clear path to, towards something that makes sense for them where they can have the same things that their parents had. So I think that that's partially why they're eager to build a new system uh, built more around decentralization and like have their own currency and their own banking and their own decentralized financial, you know, systems and their own, uh, mon uh, their own uh, art collecting, uh, you know. So I think what we're seeing 
is almost a generational culture clash, right? So we're about to go through the largest wealth transfer in human history. Um, so the boomers are, are starting to pass down generational wealth to younger people, but that younger generation looks very different, right? From the generation that's passing down the wealth. They're much more interested in things like collecting things digitally, for example, than accumulating a bunch of physical things and you know experiences and online communities. So we're about to see um, the way that that money gets invested that's being handed down from one generation to the next. Um, it, it'll be invested, I think, in very different ways from what we've seen in the last 10, 20, 30 years. And that's part of what we're seeing in crypto. I, I do agree with you because, you know, maybe if I talk to my parents, they would say, you know, you need to buy a house, you need to have real estate. And, and also they didn't travel so much. So, you know, whatever you own, you need to feel it, you need to touch it. But, you know, a generation that was grown up on a plane and see that the world is actually small and you can be anywhere, then, you know, then having physically stuff in your hand or a house to look after or a place by the seaside where you actually want to see the world, it becomes, it becomes more like a, Oh, God, like a pain or something that, you know, uh, a baggage rather than uh, an asset that, you know, you really want to have as a priority. So I get you on that. But I think another element that maybe you can um, help me to unlock is about empowerment, because you talk a lot about community and definitely in the art space, for example, there is a lot of bureaucracy and barriers actually for artists to um, come out, to, you know, start to sell their stuff because uh, they need the right agent, they need to be under the spotlight. You know, if you don't have much money, you can't be in the circle, you are cut out and that's it. You will never have a career. But this way with crypto, actually the barrier of entry is just lower and, and uh, you know, that kind of empowers more people to actually make it and, and express their cre um, creativity. Yeah, I think you're spot on. So, uh, you know, uh, I graduated in the late 1990s with an art degree and lived in, you know, I'm a white male who lives in Boston. So I had some advantages, not too far from New York, you know, um, and I had a hard time finding, you know, of the few galleries that were in Boston, any that would actually accept my work or be interested in what I was doing. Like that didn't feel like an opportunity that was really there or available to me. Now imagine if you were born like my friend Osanachi in Nigeria, right, uh, where uh, didn't have a lot of access to the traditional art world, but he was able, you know, three or four years ago on his own through the internet to find the early sort of NFT communities um, and didn't have to ask, you know, anyone permission to produce NFTs, right, because it's a more open system where he could just put his work up at different markets and it was slow at first and there wasn't a lot of interest, but now he's pretty famous and, you know, Celebes and Christie's fight to have his work in um, and shown. And, and, you know, he's one example that I use a lot, but there are dozens of folks that I know who would tell you the same thing. They would say, I had zero chance, zero chance because of the way the traditional art market is made of ever finding my way into these, you know, museums or, you know, the, the better known um, art galleries, things like that. And uh, as a result of, of crypto art, they've had access. Now, the flip side of that, because some people are like, yes, but Jason, not every artist is going to have that great experience, right? Not every artist is going to go into NFTs and make a bunch of money or get a bunch of recognition. And, and I would say, well, yeah, of course that's true. Like there is no system where everyone gets to be an artist and everyone gets to make a lot of money. If that's, if that's the bar for success, we'll never reach it because it's never going to yeah. happen. But we have to, what we do have to do is acknowledge this new system, this decentralized system that we have at least gives the, the few people that are succeeding, at least they're a little bit more diverse and people have a shot, right? Without having to rely exactly. on traditional art system. more access at least. Yeah. So, I mean, everybody has at least has a little bit of a shot or, or access to it. So, yeah, I think it's, it's exciting. It's an exciting time for artists to feel like they can participate. And no, not everybody's going to get rich, but at least people can have a little bit more control over over um, how they get their work out there. And we're seeing a lot of collectors come in, new collectors come in, and these artists are embracing them rather than turning their nose up and saying, well, you don't know, you're not a collector or you don't have enough money. They're saying, you know, I'm really glad that you're here to collect my work and the collectors are glad to be there. So we've got sort of a virtuous cycle there, in my opinion.
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Listen, I want to talk a bit about your company, Club NFT, because uh, it really linked one of uh, the issue that uh, I think, you know, any NFT collector should ask uh, him or herself about storage. Because, all right, you buy an NFT and then you keep it in your MetaMask wallet, if you when you link it with OpenSea, you can say that. But you know, there are questions about security of storage that actually should be raised. And anybody that is in NFT should actually ask himself, uh, you know, what's the best way to secure? Are the assets really secure if I just need disconnect the wallet? I mean, can they get corrupted? Uh, what is gonna happen? So you you are the expert here. Yeah. So what happened to me, um, I started collecting in late 2017, early 2018, and I was buying these very early NFTs for $10, $15, $20. um, And then the market crashed. Um, So I was also lecturing around that time and flying around the world and telling people, this is great. Art on the blockchain is great because if the marketplaces go under, you don't have to worry about it because it's on the blockchain and you own it. It's decentralized. Like you, you, you can show everybody that you own these NFTs and you never have to worry about it. But what happened when those markets crashed, all of a sudden I couldn't access my NFTs or the images wouldn't show up. And I thought, well, what am I missing? What did I get wrong? Right. Uh, fast forward to 2021. And we see what was, you know, a market that was maybe a few million dollars become a $40 billion NFT market. And no one had solved these same problems that I faced in 2018. So fundamentally, what happens is people don't realize that the blockchain is not a great um, place to store large files, right? It's a great spot um, to distribute transactions so that everybody can see them and nobody can alter them and prove that you've transacted. But for storing something like JPEGs or certainly, you know, movie files, it's just too expensive. So nobody does it. So none of these, when you go to a marketplace and you fall in love with an artwork or a, a, you know, a video art piece or whatever, and you buy that NFT, None of that lives on the blockchain. It doesn't have those properties of the blockchain. If you're lucky, best practices, it, it'll live on something called IPFS. And your, your NFT is just a, a piece of code on the blockchain that points to the image that you, you know, or the artwork that you love or that you bought. And what people don't realize is someone has to pay to store that image. So if marketplaces go out of business, like we saw in 2018 and stop paying for that storage, your image disappears forever, and now you own an NFT that you might have spent ten thousand, a hundred thousand, ten million dollars. People are spending lots of money. It now points to nothing. So you have a broken NFT that points to nothing, right? Right. So, so, so basically, it's the marketplace that does store the NFT, yeah, and then blockchain is just the technology that allows you to point it to your wallet in order to see it. But if OpenSea was gonna go, you know, was just gonna have some kind of issue and broke, right? Then uh, then the NFT that I have on OpenSea that would just uh, not disappear, but not linked anymore. Right, you would have a broken NFT. It's like you would have the keys to a car, but no car, right? So you would have the uh, NFT. So how much is your key to your Lamborghini worth? Maybe $5, $10. How much uh, is your Lamborghini worth, right? Uh, so the, so you have the, the, the NFT, the code that points to the artwork that you fell in love with, but the artwork is no longer there. Now, the magic is that um, if, if they're using IPFS, if they're storing it on IPFS, even if the marketplace goes away and stops paying and it disappears, that image disappears from IPFS, as long as you, the collector, or, or really anyone, downloads all the files associated with the NFT that were living on IPFS, if you download them all in the exact format that the artist put them up, yeah. then, then you can restore them at any time to IPFS, and all of a sudden, your NFT is worth money again. Now, okay. you, that may sound um, small or silly, but when we think about again, a $40 billion market where people aren't even aware that what they're buying doesn't live on, on yeah. chain. And, and so what we're doing is building a, a tool, a free tool that gives them the ability to type in their public address. And it just goes through and it crawls almost like how Google crawls websites. We crawl through wallets and we find all those off-chain files and metadata and, and interdependencies. And we give them to you in a zip file and you don't have to trust us. Um, you don't have to trust anybody else. You just have to keep a copy of those files and then you can always restore them later. So yeah, we're backstopping a pretty big percentage of the $40 billion NFT market by giving people access to the files they need in order to, to retain the value that's associated wow. with them. 
So how have you be- built this technology? So it's actually scalable as you get more and more people demanding to use your, uh, um, your product. Yeah, we haven't hit that point yet. In the next week or two, we'll be putting out um, the the first uh, beta results for folks. We have about 2000 people signed up um, and we have to solve, you know, it's with software, you solve each problem one at a time. Right. So first was how do we even crawl through everybody's wallets and find these things? Right. Which is it turns out it's a lot harder than we thought it was going to be. Um, But we're we're getting there in, in a couple of weeks we'll launch. And then it's how do we scale and automate these things? And then it's how do we report information back live to people about as they're collecting about which ones are safe, which ones aren't safe. And then we think even beyond that, we might be able to start warning people when they're going to collect which which NFTs um, are on IPFS and which ones aren't and really educate people about the, the long term um, effects of how their particular NFT might be constructed. And it might actually shape how people collect. How can I know if uh, my NFT is uh, on IPFS or not? I mean, the, the user person is going to be able to understand that. Or I mean, I guess I don't know. Most people don't. Most people don't. Actually, I would argue most people don't understand what NFTs are. They just get excited, right? I mean, it's like the new thing and everyone's excited. So they're spending lots and lots of money. Uh, Most people I talk to think all the art lives on the blockchain. They don't even realize that it doesn't live there and that there's a, a major risk there. So yeah, the way you can find out whether or not your files, actually your artworks live on IPFS or not, is also through our tool. So we'll go in and tell you what percentage of your um, NFTs are on IPFS. And if they're not on IPFS, then you should be really worried because they're probably on like a third party server like AWS. And in that case, if the marketplace shuts down, um, even if you downloaded the files, there's nothing you can do because the link on that, that NFT is going to point to a spot that will never be supported again. It was yeah. some company like Jason's company, you know, slash, you know, um, you know, artwork, you know, dot com or whatever. Well, that will never come back. Right. So you can't you almost can't restore those ones. Oh. So, so, yeah, I think there's. You know, I hate to be the one that's out there, like, you know, telling everybody about the bad parts because I love NFTs and I came in early. But I think the way we grow this space is really to educate folks about the risks and to help build the infrastructure that's missing. So many people want to build marketplaces because that seems like a fast way to make money. It's like, oh, we'll start a company. We'll build a marketplace. And I thought, well, we almost have grown too fast in this space. And what we need really is a company that will focus on some of the infrastructure and some of these problems that are maybe a little bit more concerning. So, but when a marketplace is selling NFT, would the marketplace decide if those NFT are on IPFS or or they are gonna be on the platform? Who does, you know, the job is the artist is the marketplace. It can be, yeah, it it can be either way. Um, Usually it's the marketplace because most artists aren't technical enough to sort of write their own smart contracts and set up their own storage uh, system. So usually when an artist goes to a marketplace, there's a, an interface and it says, okay, upload your art and check this box to agree that, you know, this art is by you. You're not putting art that somebody by somebody else and type in the metadata. And, you know, it probably produces a thumbnail image of that and it puts the actual image up and then it has the metadata. Um, and it chooses the marketplace in that case would choose where to store that, right. Or where to, where to pin that. Um, and, um, some marketplaces choose to, to pin it to IPFS and, and some, you know, don't. And some do go to IPFS, but have pretty strange processes in terms of how they set it up. So I think it's kind of like I'm not a car guy, right? I've been driving cars my whole life. But if, if you open the hood and ask me what was under the hood, I wouldn't really know what's going on, right? But I think that's, that's similar. A lot of people bought NFTs last year, just like people like me buy a car, but they never asked like, What's actually under the hood and how does this work? And I think this year we'll see people kind of slow down now that all this money has been spent and ask themselves these questions like, how are NFTs constructed and what's actually going on here? And how do I protect my best interest and make sure that I can protect my collection, right? So that it doesn't, the value doesn't disappear. From your experience, uh, um, maybe with users trying to, you know, to, to use your solution, What's the, did, did you have many people that bought NFT on OpenSea coming to you and what were the results that you find? Is, is OpenSea supporting IPFS or not really? 
Um, I mean, I know that you can't have an 100% picture because, you know, um, but, but maybe from the experience that you had got so far. Yeah, I'm hesitant to call out any one marketplace versus another. Um, at some point, we'll publish sort of our best practices that go through and talk about um, every, uh, every single marketplace. But I would say that people will be surprised at um, how vulnerable that their, yeah. their NFTs potentially are in the, lo the long run. Now, another thing that sometimes people come to me and they say, is that would that ever actually happen? Like these, these are so popular now. NFTs are so popular. Is it possible that a large marketplace could ever go out of business? Right. And we particularly heard this after our launch um, in the fall. And I was like, yeah, you know, it happened in 2018. And people were like, yeah, but they're so popular now. It'll never happen. And then a week later, after we launched and announced the company, um, Hicket Nunk, which was either the second or large, third largest NFT marketplace, they were based on Tezos, just shut off overnight. Um, it was run by, you know, one guy who decided that he was upset, not happy anymore, and just shut it down. And there were something like a, a half million um, NFTs on there. And, you know, so we jumped into action and along with lots of other people in the community and volunteered to pay because our solution wasn't in place yet to pay to keep pinning those works on IPFS. But it was an example, a very real tangible example, right, to a large number of people that we've been kind of taught or programmed to think that when we buy NFTs, we have complete control over them and own them. But if that were the case, when a marketplace went down, it shouldn't impact us. Yeah. And it still does. Yeah, I think the main misconception, and this is what also the media and the news are inculcating in the head of people that, by the way, they probably don't know what NFT really are, is that an NFT is something that you own on blockchain. So they think an NFT not as key, but more as a, a JPEG or a video or some kind of like digital assets, but it's not that. It's a key to something that leaves not on a blockchain. So, yeah, I mean, here's a philosophical question, and, and I think this is where the, the whole the growth of the market got, got confused. Um, in the early days, people that were collecting NFTs, they came from the crypto world. They were cryptocurrency traders, right? Yeah. And for, for a lot of those early collectors, they actually think of the code that does live on the blockchain as the valuable part because their background was in tokens, right, and, and yeah. crypto. So it made sense to them that I'm buying a token and the token, the code that sits on the blockchain is the thing I care about. And the image is just like what that token looks like. It's an artist's conception of what that looks like. Almost doesn't matter, right? And for, for a year or so or a couple of years, that was okay because it was only crypto people, right? But in 2000, or 2021, what happened is all these new people that came in and all this money that yeah. came in, they're thinking – about the image. They don't actually know exactly. much about the token. So they're buying the image or they're buying the video and in their head, that's the value, that's the emotional connection. That's And if you ask them what the token on the blockchain is, they're like, I don't know, it's like a receipt. They don't think of the token as the art, right? So it, it actually, the whole thing breaks when you start thinking about the image or the, the video um, as the art and not the token, because you have to remember that the only thing that you can prove you own is the token. So when the token no longer links to that image, right, that the perceived value for all these new collectors where all this money comes in goes out the window. No one wants it. That's that's why I use that analogy of sort of the keys to the Lamborghini. You know, like the, the image is in, for most people is the, the, the Lamborghini. Lamborghini. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and it's so crazy. That's why I, I really think education is so important, especially now that, you know, as you said, we already kind of uh, been living in the hype of NFTs, but we are coming down to reality and we have to understand where we are putting all this money and how that really works, the infrastructure. So it's so interesting, Jason. So what is next for Club NFT? Tell me something you're working on. I understand you have got some kind of report guidelines coming out, but what, what we can basically find more from your platform? Yeah, it's it's probably the most exciting time um, in Club NFT's life so far. So last week we launched um, rightclicksave.com. So that's our, our new editorial. It sort of stands independent of Club NFT, but it educates collectors on aspects of art and tech around NFTs. You, know, you were just talking about how um, it's sort of a confusing space and not, you know, there's an opportunity to teach people and help them understand and protect them. We think a lot of that has to be done through writing. Um, so rightclicksave.com is sort of our editorial for that. And then um, end of this week, beginning of next, our very first beta users will start to get their zip files and their downloads um, from 
the Ethereum aspects of their collection. So we were right now just um, first wave working on Ethereum NFTs, but the goal is to expand out to Tezos and other chains. Okay. So um, just in these last two weeks, uh, we've launched a new editorial. Our earliest users will start to get their download tool. And then we've got some other pretty cool stuff in the works um, software wise around discovery tools, but it's very early on that. So it'll probably be like mid year before folks start to hear about that. Okay, that's very interesting. Now, I uh, want to ask you just a final question about NFT interoperability and all these kind of chain that support NFT. So we have got NFT on Polygon, we have got NFT on Ethereum, NFT on Flow, Solana. Well, what are your... Uh, um, Tell me a little bit your views on this um, maybe goal of interoperability and perhaps, uh, I don't know if it's fair to say, is there any chain that would be better than another chain to be used for NFTs? Or maybe this is something that doesn't really make sense as a, you know, as a, as a question. No, I think it's a great question. Um, so a lot of times what you see in the community, we call them maximalists or maxis, people yes. that are like almost religious about one chain. Um, I've been lucky in the last year, I got to spend a lot of times and uh, a lot of time and make friends with the two gentlemen that invented the blockchain, um, Scott uh, Stordetta and Stuart Haber. And, you know, they actually are very bright guys and believe that we're going to have a multi-chain future, that there'll always be multiple chains. And I tend to agree with them that certain chains will specialize in one thing over another. So I think we, rather than assume that we're going to uh, have a future where we're eventually we see consolidation and there's only one chain, we need to accept the fact that different chains will be good for different things, right? So uh, more broadly, I would say um, I'm hoping to see a shift towards proof of stake away from proof of work for, for NFTs because that's more environmentally friendly. So chains like uh, Tezos and I believe Solana um, are, are a proof of stake. And also we need to kind of solve this issue of uh, high gas fees. So if you look at yeah. Ethereum, which is the dominant NFT blockchain, um, gas fees, you know, can and often are, you know, $100 or more. And if we want to grow this space out into, um, you know, NFTs out into something that everybody around the world can participate in, we can't have, most people can't afford to spend $100 or more just to transact, right? So those are issues that need to be solved. Um, but I think we could see multiple blockchains solving them. And I think we also will have NFTs that are specialized for like access tokens for live events or ticketing or NFTs that are for gaming or NFTs for like your high school diploma. And the requirements for these different NFTs may actually change and certain blockchains may be better for one use case versus the other. Exactly. Well, it's gonna. It's, it is very interesting. So I look forward to, um, you know, see how the space develop, and uh, definitely I'm gonna check out your tools because, uh, yeah, I think uh, you raise up some really good question for many people that are in the NFT space. And uh, yeah, those questions need to be thought uh, carefully because, you know, if we are considering NFT as an investment, we, we always say to people, you need to protect your investment. You need to make sure that, you know, that it is not under risk. And wh when it comes to NFT, all oh, right, it's okay. I just connect my wallet, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, and then you actually don't even know what you own. And now it's not just about knowing your MetaMask password or, uh, you know, seed phrase. There is much more. And uh, yeah, it's great for people like you, really. They are doing uh, so much work and try to find solutions. Absolutely. I mean, I, I often focus more on the art than the financial side. Uh, but the truth is, uh, multiple NFTs that I owned from you know, early 2018 that I no longer have access to would now easily sell for uh, several million dollars each. So, I, you know, my life would be very different um, if this problem didn't exist. So I bought the first NFTs by uh, a crypto artist named Xcopy, who's one of the best known artists in the space. His work, you know, recently sold for $7 million, one of his wow. works, right? And I own the very, very, very first ones, right? And what uh, is that? What, what's that? What is that? What is that, the, the NFT? What are the first ones? Yeah, they were on a platform called Ascribe, a very early platform called Ascribe. And okay. Ascribe, Ascribe went out of business, right? And no one can figure out where the heck those NFTs are and what went wrong there. Some people think they were never minted, but the front of the interface was working, but the blockchain in the back wasn't. But the whole business went, you know, disappeared and went out of business. And now there's lots of people talking back, but it's not, I don't want to just beat up a scribe. We also saw um, Rare Art Networks uh, went out of business. And I was lucky enough that 
I could reach out to those people because I'm known in this community and they were able to recover some of those tokens. But then there's digital objects. They went out of business. Additional went out of business. And when these companies went out of business to varying varying problems and to varying degrees, they kind of broke and people ran into these issues. So, you know, uh, what we're building won't necessarily solve all of those issues, but we, and, and you know, the problems that happened to me aren't necessarily things that all would have been solved by our, the solution that we're building. But we think that people have to start thinking about all these problems, isolating exactly. them and building out solutions. Exactly. Well, uh, Jason, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your views. And uh, I hope to have you back soon that we can talk more maybe about the progress of uh, Club NFTs. Sounds great. Thank you, Stefania. I really thank enjoyed you. our conversation. Bye-bye. Take care.